Keys to the Commonwealth, a podcast where we share the real stories of local community members who are using real estate to build personal wealth, along with tips and tricks from professionals across the industry. And now, your host, Landry Fields. Welcome back to another episode of the Keys to the Commonwealth podcast. This is Landry. I'm excited for another week, another podcast episode. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit uh, today, more or less, about just getting into, I guess, uh, equity and wealth in relation to real estate to begin with. And I think that's becoming a, a topic that needs to be discussed more, especially with the younger generation or first-time homeowners as far as being able to set yourself up for future success, future wealth, uh, building, and so forth. So uh, today... Uh, we've got Brad on the the podcast here from Ruoff Mortgage, and we're going to talk all about those things. Brad, appreciate you coming on the, on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So you're at Ruoff, but uh, let's back up as we always do and hop in the DeLorean and tell me about how you got there, where you came from. I know you've got some interesting backgrounds too on some stuff. So Yeah, I was a math major in college and okay. uh, did sales and um, did really well with it. And got Originally from the area? I grew up in E-Town. I was okay. born in Southern Indiana yeah. um, and then moved to E-Town when I was 11. I was in E-Town. Uh, everybody went to UK or Western or L, mm-hmm. and I decided to go to Eastern because I didn't want to go to high school all over again. So I chose there. Uh, That's so true. My wife's from a small town and it's like all of her friends came to with her. And so her high school friends were also her college yeah. friends. And it was like, yeah, E-Town's not, I mean, it's not small, but I think my graduating class was 149. Right. And I think yeah, there was two people, three people that went to Eastern. Gotcha. So it was, uh, it allowed me to branch out and do different things. but. Uh, Went there for a math degree and decided that I didn't want to teach. Yeah. Um, got into sales. Uh, that took me down a weird path um, in New York style pizza. Yeah. Um, and uh, opened my first restaurant at 26 years old and was in pizza for 16 years. And uh, just came in one day and decided I didn't want to work 80 hours a week and make yeah. $40,000 a year anymore. Wasn't uh, it? It was Brooklyn pizza, right? Yeah. Yeah. My Brooklyn brother pizza for those that remember that. Yeah, it was. I mean, it's still. I think it's still well known. Um, for those who don't know, I, I my brother and I opened it when we were young. Um, had it, uh, sold it once when I got a divorce. Um, it was open for another couple of years, went out of business, and then um, had the opportunity to reinvent it. Um, had it for a couple of years, and it just it started to get more difficult um, with yeah. employees and things like that. And just what came in one day, I was like, I want to do something else. Uh, so I knew a guy that did this, he and I actually worked together out of college. Um, and he's done this for 20 years and, uh, we were out having a beer one night and I go, you think I could do what you do? Cause I mean, <laughs> no offense to him. He never really worked really hard. I yeah. could tell that he, you know, he'd put a lot into it. Uh, and I needed the opportunity. I had full custody of my kids at the time. I need or the maybe not work as hard as 80 hours a week. Exactly. Kind of yeah. scenario. Before you move on to that though, I got to ask like, being a pizza person, owning pizza, who, if you're going to go eat pizza in this town, where are you going to go eat pizza? Pearls. Pearls? Pearls, yeah. Where's that? It's real small. It's right behind Coeur d'Alema. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So like across from the courthouse? courthouse yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's the best in town. Okay. Um, I don't know the owners. I know that it just sold uh, and they got a new partner. Uh, okay. Two, f- two, fee- uh, two women own it. Uh, they, it's, yeah. what, you know, one of the few women-owned restaurants in Lexington, which I, I love. Uh, but they... They seat 50. Um, they do pizza in the evenings, and I think they start doing bagels in the morning. Uh, but yeah, it's. I just moved to Woodford when we got rolling oven there, and I've been a big fan of that style. Kind of excellent. Everybody has their thing. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. I'm very much a pizza snob. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll eat Grimal- I like Grimaldi's, and there's a couple other ones I'll eat. Uh, yeah, yeah. But if, I'm, if I want a good yeah. one that I actually enjoy, it's either Pearls or Grimaldi's. Okay. Um, Sorry, yeah. I, I had to ask. No, I'm a, I'm a huge day. pizza nerd. <laughs> Like we could do a whole podcast on pizza and like, I've got a friend who's still in the business yeah. and will call me on flour, like to ask me about making flour reasons why dough does do certain things or whatever else. So, um, um, I love the restaurant industry. Well, uh, what's your take on Portnoy's, uh, ratings things he does for pizza? Is he's, it, is he's he spot on? You think yeah. Serious? I mean, yeah. I don't know, you know, his personality and everything mm-hmm. else. I, I don't know how much that's a shtick and how much, you know, is real, but it, it, what he talks about is legit. Like, okay. Those are some of the things that I look at. I mean, I can look at a pizza and can tell if I would be disgusted. So it's just not BS. It's not no, all BS. No. Like he actually, it's yeah. kind of like. Okay. There's a science okay. to it, okay. especially New York style pizza. It has to be a certain way. And it, the, the whole old wives tale of they get the water shipped in is not true. 
Like, okay. I don't know if you ever heard that. Yeah. Yeah. You go to New York style pizza place and they're yeah. like, how do you, how do you get to make like the yeah. all we have the water shipped in from New York? No, they don't. Yeah. They use the same water out of the tap. It, yeah. You know, it's, uh, Interesting. it's just a little thing they say. <laughs> Anyhow. So you're getting into a uh, mortgage then. And so is how long you been in that then in general? Yeah. I know you've been a few different places and different stuff. Seven so, years. Uh, so getting into that, go back to that part. Yeah. So I, you know, I told the guy, I was like, do you think I could do with it? you do and he's like well you're the best salesman i've ever met how are you with numbers and i was like well, i was a math major in college so <laughs> it kind of worked i guess i was always supposed to do something like this yeah. um but uh he was moving companies back to the place he had been and said look i'll talk to this guy to see if he would take you on as a a, a junior lo or an L, you know loa which is a loan officer assistant so he went in talked to the guys like yeah i went in interviewed and uh you know, he asked me questions. He said, you know, the guy told me, because I've been to your restaurant. I know you're great with people. I know you're a great salesman. Um, he goes, how many realtors do you think you know? And I sat there and counted them up. And I you know, with 34. Holy. And, uh, being, you know, restaurant business for 16 years, you just, yeah. you know, half the town. And even if I don't know them, I know them. Right. Uh, so he said, well, I'll give you a job. You know, it's commission-based only. Um, you can try it out, you know, and we'll see how it works. So, um, seven years later, I'm now the vice president of the mortgage bankers association. I'm I think one of the top lenders in town. Um, I feel like I'm a respected lender. Uh, the, but the funny thing I tell people is in seven years, I've closed three or 400 loans. Yeah. Um, one loan with one of those 34 realtors that I knew beforehand. Everything. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, interesting. Of course, the way the climate's changed, some of the realtors are not in it anymore. And in most of respects, these, most of these be. are. It's yeah. just it's one of those things because I've had other LOs come in after me uh, yeah. as trainees and stuff, and I always try to mentor anybody. I, I like to teach and like to help people, and uh, you know, I would see these realtor or excuse me, these loan officers come in that have been in the industry and know a ton of realtors, and then just not be able to get their foothold. And I would tell them, I'm like, you cannot get business from people you know. I don't know why. I don't know whether they think it's a friendship thing or whatever else. They may give you a shot and they give you an opportunity, but at the end of the day, you have to build your business. Yeah. It's well, it's that adage, like it's it's a what is it? It's easier for a a stranger to be, what's the word I'm the phrase I'm looking for? It's like easier for like a a, a client or a referral partner to become a friend than it is for like you know, a family member to refer you or something along the lines. I'm butchering this no, like I, that but that makes complete yeah, sense. It's yeah. like I'm butchering that. That that whole thing, but yeah, uh, something along those lines. Yeah, because now that I've been in the industry, oh, it's it's easier for a client to become a friend than a friend to become a client. Right. That's the phrase. Yeah. yeah. So to your point, and you're much better off because I've done deals for family and friends, and I now tell them that I can't do deals for families and friends that I have to give it to somebody else in the office. So just because it's such yeah. a nightmare, they expect yeah. so much yeah. and don't really have um, a realistic expectation. Sure, of it's hard to sometimes do. to hear no from somebody that. Yeah. a trusted friend or family member. So, yeah. Um, let's go down the current market scenario. Obviously, that's been a roller coaster for especially loan officers over the last, uh, I mean, just feels like 24 months now, probably, right? Yeah, so kind we're, of like, we're, we're approaching 24 months. Where uh, are we now? Where are we kind of headed in the next 12 months so that you can, obviously no one knows for sure, but what, you know, where you kind of see potential expectations or where markets are trending right now? Uh, as far as, I mean, it's been a rough 24 months, but I think it's something that we need. Um, you know, during, during COVID, a lot of people got into this industry. Um, a lot With of real, unrealistic expectations of how right. like, long term. Right. It's how it was. And I just actually uh, had a lunch and learn today that I explained this to some realtors. I'm like, look, anybody could sell a house or do a loan two and a half years ago, you know, but what happened is the people that are in industry are, you know, the, the people that are going to last. You make a ton of money really quickly. So you can do two things with money. You can be smart with it or you can not be smart with it. So what a lot of smart loan officers and realtors have done have understood that, hey, this was a global pandemic. It's probably not going to come back around. This refinance boom, I mean, before COVID, I'd been in business three or four years, had never done a refinance, you know, in three years because rates were relatively level, sure. same, you know, with, with, Refinance, our rule of thumb kind of is you can save a full interest point or $100 a month, makes it worth it. So, in that market, it really wasn't there. So, right. when COVID hits, all of a sudden, you know, that boom is there. You can save hundreds and, you know, hundreds of dollars. So, 
you know, people got into it and they're like not understanding that that's a, it's an anomaly, right? Yeah. So I paid off all my debt, bought the kids some stuff, you know, took a couple trips, yeah. sacked some money away. I went four months without closing a loan at one period. You yeah. know, I was closing 10 to 12 loans a month during COVID. And, you know, it gets scary, but I don't, I'm not really worried about it. Now I'm closing through two or three months. Yeah. It's still not where I want to be, sure. but I still have that. So I'm going to make it through. And that's the thing is yeah. like, you just want to make it through because I was told by a 20 year vet uh, in the industry that, you know, you've never been through this, Brad, but once you make it through, you're in it for life. And you're, you're kind of one of those stalwarts you know, that are, are always going to be there. Yeah. So what we've seen now is tens of thousands of realtors and loan officers have gotten out of the business in the last few months. Oh yeah. Because those people have decided that was always going to be that way. They bought brand new cars. They upgraded their houses. They bought investment properties. They took trips, they cars, boats, you know, anything and everything because they thought that that was always going to be there. Well, it's not now. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. Uh, So what those people have had to do with either sell those things or take on other full-time jobs that take them out of the industry just to, you know, to manage those payments. So it's made it very tough. So I think what we're going to see start to happen is an attrition of, you know, loan officers and realtors. And I think it's, you know, it's going to more concentrate to the good ones that you want to have, you know, the ones that are going to be able to make it through, you know, we're learning things throughout this process that um, are going to make the, things a little easier as things start to open back up. But, uh, you know, that's, you know, the income or the employee side of it. But as far as, you know, inventory, inventory is what it is. Yeah. You know, you can't build them that quick. Um, appreciation. As you and I both know, once rates come down, what's going to happen to, especially in our market of Kentucky, where there's a dem- higher demand as far as people moving to the area and so forth. It's going to be a mad dash. It's going to be a mad dash. And then the rates of all these houses, the prices are, the houses are all going to continue to go up. It's exactly what I said earlier today, too. They were like, well, what's going to, I was like, it's going to make it a nightmare again. Yeah. You know, that $300,000 house, once rates are in five and a half, you're going to be in a bidding war for it. Do you think that's going to be nationwide or do you think it's going to just be in pockets of areas as like, because you obviously, it's like, you don't want to let the lid off too quickly in some respects, which I get. So, I I mean, I don't want to be the Fed trying to figure this out, but you know. Well, the Fed doesn't really, I mean, the Fed does have some effect on interest rates, it, it, you know, but not a whole lot. It's more mortgage-backed securities and 10-year treasuries. Yeah. So, but it is all kind of tied together. So I don't think, what's going to cause the market to, to take off, I think, is inventory is going to come back. Rates will drop a little. Yeah. But there's no telling when that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, people always love to ask a loan officer, what are rates going to do? If anybody actually tells you... <laughs> They're, I mean, they're lying. Yeah. They're, we have no clue. If any of us knew yeah. what rates were going to do, yeah. we'd be retired by now because we could hedge, you know, 10-year treasuries. And well, for those that don't know, then talk just like a brief outline, brief points of like what really does impact those rates in general. So there's, there's, there's a, a lot of people that obviously have no clue. Like yeah. what or what, how, why? There's a few things. And I mean, even I won't be able to explain it that well because there's so many things that go into it. But, you know, they're tied to... Uh, Mortgage-backed securities, uh, they're traded in a 10-year treasury. Well, they're basically polar opposite of each other. So if so they're, they're buying into one, if they're buying mortgage-backed securities and that price is going up, that means the 10-year treasury is going down, and that means interest rates are going down. Okay. And if once they feel like mortgages are a bad investment because they're being oversold or rates are too high or people can't afford them, then those mortgage-backed securities will go the other way and 10-year treasuries will go up because they're, they're putting their money in that. That's when rates go up. Those are also affected by uh, unemployment numbers, inflation numbers, yeah. several different... Because that's a weird part that I don't think most people know about either is that like we always think unemployment, like we don't want very high unemployment, which I get. But in some ways, rising unemployment is in an, in an economy like we are in right now is actually a good sign because that means there's going to, you know, people are going to start spending money less, et cetera. And obviously no one wants that to an extent, but it's like, 
There's always a cause and effect, yeah. obviously. Checks yeah, and balances exactly. for everything there has to be. And yeah. this this market is a, is one of those checks and balances. I mean, you can't just keep lending money at 2.5% and having houses appreciate. 2.5%. <laughs> like, it's crazy. Like, I remember at one point I had um, uh, a realtor call me about doing a refinance. And I said, it's 3%. He was like, why so high? And I go, when the hell did 3% become high? <laughs> Like it was, it's one of those that, you know, you can't, you can't make, you never can make everybody happy. Yeah. Like it's 3%. And, um, it's just silly that it was there and people just still were complaining. I've heard this and maybe you can either nullify this or speak to this at all, but these kind of rumors about them potentially introducing 40 year mortgages, which I'm not the biggest fan of obviously in the, in some ways as a way to kind of like, because ultimately let's think about this, your interest rates, but houses and property are way more expensive. So, uh, interest, you know, these 14, 15% interest rates 40 years ago on a house that was worth 90,000. That's a whole lot different price in comparison to the average income percentage that you're spending on your uh, monthly rent or mortgage versus now it's in the area of 300 plus thousand average house. So, so, you know, it's kind of a weird aspect there because it's now more expensive to own a house than yeah. it is even when they were at 14 yeah. and 15%. You know, so, yeah, so I that's, know. It, the, I hadn't just really personal heard it, thoughts. I, I think I, th- I think I had kind of heard it, but I just kind of tucked it away. Um, I'm the type of person that I'll deal with it when it happens. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. I don't like there, the idea. There, there never used to be a seven-year car loan, or I think there's a nine-year car loan now. What? Or, 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 yeah, I think that I saw the other day, it, it, or like 96-month car loan. Oh, Same thing. Because now, I mean, to get a brand-new truck, it's going to be seventy five, eighty thousand, 80000 which that's used true. to 10 years ago, you could get a house for. Yeah. You know, or you, you, get a, you, know, you get a decked-out truck, just a, a Chevy, or I think the new Tundra fully loaded with, a uh, hybrid was ninety five to a hundred thousand. You know, seven years ago when I got in the business, I was doing mortgages for a hundred thousand, you know, dollars within the area. So yeah. it does make sense that they're just going to kick it down the road because that is a problem. That you can I, only do that for so long, too. Well, I mean, it's it used to be that you could everybody had ten year mortgages or twenty year mortgages. Yeah. So then they went to thirty. It's it's just going to be part of our, I think, part of our society. Interesting. Unfortunately, I mean, because there's. They don't want it to fail. Right. And it just feels like it's just kicking the can down the road, basically, yeah. to, you know, our kids or grandkids or whomever type of scenario. Until there's a fix. And I don't know that there ever truly can be a fix because it would just upset the apple cart. So my, everything would just crumble and tumble around it. So it, just make, it does make sense because Interesting. one of the saddest parts for me now that everything's changed is whenever I get that phone call from a first-time home buyer. That they, you know, they make twenty five, thirty thousand dollars a piece. They've got decent credit. They've got yeah. five or six thousand dollars down, and they're they're pretty excited, right? And a few years ago, I, I love to help those people. You could get them a hundred seventy five thousand dollars house for a house payment of around eleven hundred dollars a month. Mortgage around eleven hundred dollars a month, and you know, really, you know, watch their life change because you helped them buy a house. Yeah. Now it's like, <sighs> I just know it's going to be very difficult to help them. Yeah. If be able to help them at all, because there are no one hundred seventy five thousand dollars houses. I mean, I I say that, but they're you know the average. Sure, there are. They just don't have anything in them. Yes. It was just like I bought like last week, where it's just studs. Uh, but no, seven years ago, <laughs> the average home loan was one hundred seventy five thousand. Yeah, you know now it's in the area or in the area. Or, yeah, yeah. Um, and now it's two twenty five to two thirty five. Mm-hmm. Now you're talking about thirty percent increase yeah. and now the the interest rates have gone back then the interest rates were in the mid fours you know now we're yeah. at seven and a half which so, i like i like the fours and fives i think that's a good spot to be in if we you get know, back to there i i don't disagree <laughs> uh when i got in the business uh they had just went from high threes to fours in the first year and a half they trended around the mid fours mid to high fours right before covid the conversation was they were going to get to six we had just got to five and a quarter really and then covid hit and they dropped to four and a half, and then they dropped to the mid to low threes. Yeah. And then there was a scare one day. I remember I woke up. I had over a million dollars. I think I had four loans, three, no, three or four, lo- three or four loans that I was doing at the time, and had just priced them all out on rate the night before, and said, "Hey, let me know. I'll lock these first thing in the morning." 
Uh, I looked at him again in the morning, kind of got everything together, emailed everybody. Hey, guys, let me know what you're thinking. Five minutes later, when the market opened, when we could lock loans, everything went up a full point. Because there was a scare. I can't really remember what yeah, caused yeah. it, but it just kind of jumped up. But, you know, and I'm calling. I'm like, hey, uh, hold on. Let me figure it out. Yeah. So we got it figured out. Like there was a, there was a change in the company. Everybody kind of did some stuff. But, uh, you know, when those prices move up three or $400 because an interest point is moved, that's real money. I mean, yeah. that's $300 a month in just interest. So now that first time home buyer is going to pay fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars $1,600 a month on a $200,000 house. So with a good down payment. So flipping back to more of the numbers being responsible, like, you know, if, for example, if they introduce a 40 year mortgage one day down the road, you know, and some mean, you mean, me and you both know that there's a lot of people that'll, most people just do that. And that'll be what they, what they do type of scenario. But there's a lot of play, ways where now we're, let's think about money from more of a smart scenario. Like you were able to do early on, you know, people, obviously the market's not going to be the same way type of deal where, I'm thinking like, oh, 40 year mortgage. Yeah, I'll do that so I can get a floor, but then I'll just pay extra principal on top of that to make, take advantage of it. Kind of like, yeah. you know, some people that take advantage of the credit cards like I do, where I still pay it off every month. Most people are not disciplined enough to do that kind of a scenario. Yeah. So, uh, but in that same regards of being like more wise with money and how to get into it, you know, I really fear for like younger siblings or my kids as far as ways to get into owning real estate as an add value for your equity and long-term wealth and success type of scenario. Uh, so let's talk about, you know, some of the programs or some of the options, you know, duplexes, ADUs, yeah. different stuff that are some of these ways that if you're thinking in the long-term success and short-term sacrifice are great ways to set yourself apart or not apart, but set yourself up for future success in a big way uh, type of scenario. Yeah, so there. I mean, there are some programs out there. I mean, there's there's quite a bit of little stuff, but there's there's a I think a there's a misnomer whenever you hear the word first time home buyer. Yeah, the first time home buyer. You can be a first time home buyer multiple times. You just can't have bought a home. I think in the last three years. Oh, really? Yeah. So you can get an FHA. More you get FHA one. whenever you want because that first time home buyer isn't considered buying your first home or buying a home within three years. That's considered buying your primary residence, your first home. Cause you know, you have your first home, your second home, your investment properties. Uh -huh. So there's a little confusion in that. Uh, so your first time home buyer for FHA know. is not, you can go from FHA. Gotcha. And you just only have one FHA loan at a time. Cause it's your primary residence. It's your first home. Of course, me and you both agree. We're not supposed to be continuing to just put only three and a half percent down on properties. The goal is to, when you talk about duplexes, yeah. uh, when it comes to duplexes, I think that's a great thing. I live in a duplex. Yeah. I've lived in a duplex for 10 years uh, and have my, my favorite child next door. Uh, yeah. She's the one that visits me the most often because she lives next door. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, whenever I went to buy it, my credit was good enough to get a conventional loan, but they required 15% down. Mm -hmm. uh, where FHA only requires 3.5% down. So it's a tremendous savings to get into that home and then to start yeah. building some equity on. Uh, but then a good way, an avenue to do, and what a lot of people do, and if you know, if I didn't own a restaurant, didn't make a lot of money, I would have probably done this throughout the time. And now it's, it's a little more difficult because everybody's buying up duplexes, but a, a, a good way to start and build that. And what a lot of people have done um, is they buy that first duplex. Yeah. They, you know, have it for two years, uh, refinance it in conventional Buy the next duplex FHA. Gotcha. Live in that for two years. Refinance a conventional, yeah. Buy the next one. Of course, there's still some tax aspects where you have to pay off the equity gain. In well, no, like because not having, not having lived in it for well, if you live in it for two years, yeah, you half of the because uh, I've had many talks with my accountant about this. What am I going to do if I want to uh, sell it? Because it's it's appreciated tremendously. Uh, she's like, well, you can take half of the equity uh -huh. or half of the gains. The other one you have to pay capital can or capital gains tax or or roll it over into a new property. Right. You could always just do the 1031. Yeah. So that's what you do. You take, yeah. you know, if you want to, if you want to take all of uh, the gains and put it on the next one, the three and a half percent, you can. Gotcha. Or you can just take that portion, roll that over and then take that other money, you know, and either buy a different property with it, save to buy other properties or 
put it in the coffers whenever you got to replace the HVAC at one of the places yeah. or a roof or something like that. But you, you let those places build. And I mean, to be perfectly honest, I bought mine 10 years ago for 170000 And the one, two houses down just sold for four ten. So, right. And, and with that point, though, you know, like you said, there's a lot of duplexes being bought up. And it's hard to find the duplex, a true duplex, at least in maybe Lexington. Like they're building new ones in other places. And it seems like the everything's gone to single family or multifamily scenario. It seems like duplexes, it's hard to find new builds with that. I know in Richmond, they're building several of them like that. But it seems like that's the, one of the ones that's kind of like that style of, of property that has, has not been developed as much in some respects. Maybe you can test that. But the aspect of like there's still other options and ways to do the similar scenario obviously you still have to qualify it individually for it um but you know things like adus as additional as additional dwelling unit. uh, units yeah. or you know like putting a little bit of money into creating a basement and renting out the basement or if you're a young person you got people that just need room you know you got roommates and you're leasing out your bedrooms and stuff like that I mean, they're just paying for your mortgage there at that point. And so then you can yeah. get quicker to a point, like you're saying, about refinancing and then go moving on, keeping that as a rental property and moving on to another, uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's the way to do own. it. So as long as you have some income coming in for there as you're appreciating, you yeah. know, building equity into it. So you can you can step up to the next house and it's still be your primary residence, be a first time home buyer. So then you get the minimum down payment and yeah. a better interest rate. Um, so let's say you bought a house for 200000 to live in it for two years. Um, uh, you know, and you've, it's a ranch on a basement, you've converted the basement to an apartment and half of your mortgage has been paid. Well, then if you find another space or something like that, that you want to do, then you can keep that as investment property. And at this point you probably owe 190, 185, let's just say, let's mm-hmm. say you just haven't really chunked much away at it. Well, as long as your next house that you're buying is worth more than what you owe on that house, you can then call that your primary is you got to move into it. Sure. But you can, you know, put as little as 5% down on a conventional loan uh, and keep the other house at, as an investment. Remind me though, you can only have what up to 10 conventional loans per person I, or some kind of limit, I think, on how many is, times I you think can do 10 this. is high. 10 is high. Maybe 10 is 10. what it was for a couple or something like that, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I want to say it's four in my, in my mind. Oh, it's a lot lower. Four. Okay. I mean, we can look it up, but uh, I, yeah, I don't think... <laughs> I don't think it's 10. There is a limit. In yeah. general, there's a limit. Check. For but I would also is. suggest that as soon as you move and you have the other one, you should yeah. just form an LLC and then title it in your LLC. or you sure. Know, move quick, to your LLC. Quick, uh, quick claim deed. deed. Yeah. Quick claim deed. You want to do that for the like umbrella that. anyway because people love to sue for yes. the most ridiculous reasons whatsoever. The amount of people that have rental properties, you know, obviously I'm in insurance. The amount of people that still have, they have their rental property still in their name, I'm just like... You know, I would like you to that point, get it out of your name if it's a rental property, a sap kind soon of a scenario. As soon as yeah, absolutely the day that you move out. You need to separate your the risk of all of your assets uh, pers- from a personal standpoint, personal finances, retirements, whatever, from anything business related. Yeah. And try to keep those as separated as possible. It, it, kind of a, a scenario. Exp- I mean a lot of people don't know that if you get sued as an individual, they can take everything you own and future earnings and things like that. But if you're an LLC, they can sue the LLC. You just bankrupt the LLC, right. get, you know, solve it. Right. There's some, move on. sometimes some loopholes around it, but for the most part, it's a, it's a lot safer of a way. Yeah. And if I could just say, like, that's why we definitely, uh, anytime we, we even remotely see that, we max out the liability for one, if it's going to be in their name. And then two, we always recommend umbrellas because assuming you don't have youthful drivers, it's literally like 10 bucks a month for yeah. an umbrella extra after it's discounted with other policies. And that's going to help separate and protect your, your wealth is what I basically say, yeah. you know, from the lawsuits and stuff like that. So there's a lot of simple ways to do things that uh, people just don't, aren't wise enough to know about, unfortunately. And that's why obviously one of the podcasts and videos are just to like try to help educate people like you're doing with, you know, because you go into a lot more detail with a lot of people on how to like, you know, their credit and how to improve yeah. credit or different things that can be done to kind of help the process type of scenario. And obviously talking to somebody like you in advance of trying to do stuff is obviously the more well recommended scenario from a loan officer. Perspective. Yeah. I, I tell people, I'm like, look, even if you don't want to buy a house for a year, yeah, call me, let me look at it, you know, because it doesn't really hurt your credit. It's one point in your credit report, but I can, the average credit saving, I can get you 34, 35 points back on your credit in a week. 
in most scenarios. So I'm mean, like, oh, do this or do that. And a lot of people don't understand too is your credit fluctuates 20 or 30 points every few days. It just depends on when certain of your debtors, you know, send the information to the, you know, the credit bureaus and then yeah. they update it. So it's always moving. Yeah. Um, but we can look at it and not everybody in my industry looks at our job this way. They, you know, there's a lot of people in industries like they get a client that says, Hey, I want to put 20% down. I want to try to buy this house. That's what they show them. They don't get any further into it. They just see if they can get approved for what the person asked for. I look at things differently. I grew up very poor in government housing on welfare. And by 26, I had opened my first restaurant. Yeah. So, you know, I've always kind of looked at things differently on how can I be better? How can I help people? How can I do certain things? So when I started doing this job, I did what everybody did because I didn't know anything else. I just looked at it. But as I got further into it, I realized, well, if this person doesn't, doesn't have to put 20% down, they can take that 5% and pay off $10,000 worth of debt. Their payment goes up 60, let's say $65 a month, but they have just eliminated $500 a month in debt. So now with that same amount of money that they've put out, they're buying the house and they're actually, you know, their payments $450 a month less than would have been if I gave them the scenario they wanted. So I look at their entire financial situation because whenever we pull credit, we get all their debts and how much everything is a month. And I, I know how much their monthly output is. So I try to, Always tell everybody, this is what you asked for, but this is what's going to help you the most and save you the most money in the long haul. Because yeah. even if they don't have debt to pay off and they don't need to put that you know, extra 5 10% down, that's when they can invest that money into something else that grows quicker yeah. than the savings they would have from putting it down on a home loan. Right. Yeah. A lot of little things like that, for sure. Any other options as far as the assistant programs out there for like new... New hires or young people trying to get into home buying? So there's a few. Um, there are some I can do, some I can't do, but they're really good programs. Uh, once a year, and they actually did it twice a year, uh, there's something called the Welcome Home Funds. Uh, most local banks can do them. They have them. I think it's around March that they start coming out. Okay. Uh, what it is, it's a, a grant, um, and I think it's $6,000 of free money. Um, I think 10,000 for BA and I may be wrong on those numbers, but as we don't do them, but I know they've gone up, Yeah. but essentially, uh, if you're buying a house at that time and you sign a contract inside that window and you do a loan with that company, uh, they, they get the grant free and you don't have to pay it back. Interesting. So that, that's helpful. Um, there are Kentucky housing corporation, um, in Frankfurt, uh, they have their own little mortgage, they have their own mortgage products, uh, and they offer a $10,000 down payment assistance. I know they help people out, et cetera, like that. But for my insurance side, they're the absolute worst to work with type of scenario. But I know they they do I, good things. With I, I love the people to. at KHC, yeah. and I love KHC itself. It, they, it has become a little more difficult yeah. with this market compression uh, because, and I won't get really into it, but they are actually, they're, they have a new program with an MRB funds, which is um, a bond program that they can give you 6% down. but it. It, there's a lot of compression in our industry. So mm-hmm. the amount of money that each bank makes on each individual loan has went from, let's say, just for round numbers, $10,000 down to $300. Is that drastic? So, yes. It's, it's tremendous because there's so much compression right now. And, wow. Um, the rates are so high. And to be able to do certain things that there has to be, you know, there's just not that profitability there. Well, Except from the banks having to shave off as much as they can mm-hmm. in some ways to try to just make sure things are still moving and well, there's, there's being, not as, being competitive. There's not as much income coming in. So there, you know, there's the overhead's great, you know, it's, so there's, there's a whole lot of ins and outs to it, but it, like, there's definitely a compression right now. Um, so with Kentucky housing, they set their own fees, rates, everything. And they they don't pay as much as a regular loan does. So there's not a whole lot of profit there now. So it's, yeah. you know, if we, if a bank does too much, um, then there could take a loss on those loans just to get them done. So, you know, you might see things don't change. You might see some banks going away from KC and not, you know, just yeah. not be able to do them because it's, it's a, it's a loss leader for them and you can only do that for so long, but it is a great thing. Like, I don't want to yeah. take it away. No, like, no. What I tell people is if that's the only thing you qualify for and I can't do it, whether it's KC or whatever, like welcome home funds, if you call, I'm going to get you to somebody that can get you there. Yeah. 
uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, I want to help people. And even if I don't get this loan, I'm hoping that they'll appreciate what I've done oh, yeah. for them. And then give if me, they can get give into it, that's so much more uh, potential future business. It's so much better for somebody just to be able to still get into owning a home. Yeah. out of the gate in some form or fashion uh, for the long term yeah. future with everything like that. So I didn't, so. Want, to, I didn't want to sound like yeah. that I was against no, KC. Like I, I, it's great. It's a yeah. great, you know, they do great things for people. Um, I was speaking just to the insurance side yeah. of trying yeah. to get no, mortgage decks updated and paid and different some things like that. That's they all. are they <laughs> are a state run. It's the only thing I state government to. facility that, that mm-hmm. runs like a state run government facility. Um, and then there's home ready and home possible. Those are Fannie and Freddie's kind of conventional discounted um, so what that is, is if you put less than 20% down mm-hmm. and you make, a, uh, as a combined household, your, your combined household is less than 80% of the area media income, mm-hmm. and then you get a discount on interest rate and mortgage insurance. Okay. And the criteria to get approved is kind of broadened. And yeah, mortgage insurance is usually something you have to pay if you're putting less than 20% Correct. down on yeah. uh, the equity of the house kind of scenario, so. Yeah, that's is that's a little insurance policy that yep. you know for the the banking case because you haven't put twenty percent down. If you default inside that, that, that takes care of the loss. If for anybody that. doesn't know, it sometimes there's stipulations how long you've had the loan, et cetera. But if the you've, your house has improved in value, uh, and you can sometimes now do a re uh, estimate of the house's value and potentially get away and waive that. Uh, sometimes usually a hundred dollars or more type yeah. of. Uh, monthly insurance uh, fee that you're paying on top of that for the mortgage uh, protection aspect of that thing. So I did that with years ago before COVID yeah. with my prior house, you know, you know equity had increased, increased enough that I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I owe own over 20% of the value of this house now. So, yeah, that's a big thing. Like, especially when people are refinancing, we got to refinance it off, um, do yeah. certain things. Yeah. Uh, whenever you get a home, you don't put 20% down. You automatically have to have mortgage insurance. You can pay it off up front. You know, generally, if, and I tell people, if you're going to put down between 15 and 19%, if your credit's pretty good, normally pay that off for $1,500 to $1,000, you know, somewhere around there, sometimes cheaper than that. But the payment's also only going to be 15 or $20 a month. So yeah, yeah. it's not crazy like people, you know, in their mind. I have seen it be terrible. I, one time I did a loan, I told the guy, I'm like, you realize your mortgage insurance is going to be $400 a month. Because his credit was not the best. He was buying a lake house wow. and his debt to income ratio was astronomical. I mean, not astronomical, but, you know, toward the max. So and he was like, yeah, I don't care. So then one, two and a half years later, I was like, hey, we need to refinance you. And it went from 400 some odd dollars down to like 90 some dollars. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. Um, and then if you do have mortgage insurance, it will automatically, it's it's calculated the day that your amortization schedule shows that you have 22% equity uh, because that's just in case there's any kind of dip, they just put that extra 2% in. It will automatically fall off. So whenever you close on your home, your documents will show you exactly where it falls off. That's based upon the purchase, the purchase price, purchase price the payments. Zone. And as you're paying it down. Right. So that's why, you know, like, so I'd paid like 400 some dollars to have them come reappraise the house yeah. basically, which I'm not sure they actually even came. They probably just looked it up on something like, yeah, that's probably. Um, I'm sure they did. Something. During COVID, well, no, I mean it was before COVID. But before COVID, they probably did come out and do it. During COVID, there was a lot of drive-by appraisals. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of hey, uh, let's FaceTime and show me the inside of your house yeah, appraisals. Yeah. And there was a lot of appraisal waivers. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that's it's it's a great way. Mortgage insurance isn't this horrible thing that everybody thinks it is. It's just another part of it. You right. know, it is high if you're a. And not a great borrower, as we say, but if you're a great borrower, it's not a whole lot. Yeah. Just that's just being back to being disciplined with the money and yeah. not trying to over leverage and extend yourself in some respects and making sure there's still stuff there for a rainy day because there's always going to be ebbs and flows in the market and society and things of that nature. So, but uh, well, I tell people yeah. too, I was like, you know, you know, at closing, I'm like, if you know, if you it, instead of making a payment, a one payment a month, take your payment split it in half. Pay that, make that payment every two, set it up on yeah. payments. Every two weeks, you make yes. half your payment. That will add a full payment on to the end of the year. It's an extra payment that you've made. And that normally drops, I think. So say it again. So you're saying, let's say your take mortgage the is $2,000 yeah. a month. So every two yeah. weeks, automatically, or just pay $1,000 every two weeks. And not, not every 15 days. 
But every two, every two, weeks. every two weeks. I see what you're saying. Because you know you have 52 weeks, so that extra two weeks yeah. is going to make a full payment at the end of the year, mm-hmm. and that's going to drop. I, th- I want to say it's six to eight years off your mortgage. But that's also over time going to help you out with the fact that you've got extra principal being t- paid down mm-hmm. every two weeks rather than every 30 days or whatnot right. from a, from a mortgage right. or payment scenario. But you also, as far as like it being cac- cac- you know, you've got a daily tax. In, interest, ta- not tax, interest on that every type of scenario. So that can also help with. Yeah. But, you know, when you, when you do that, or if you decide you're going to make extra payments, you need to let them know that it's supposed to go toward principal. Yes. Because if you don't, they're just going to act like you pay, if you're paying it in April or you pay two payments, they're just going to make a payment. Yeah. They're not going to, and that's going to be include the interest. So you want to make sure that if you're sending, if it's 2000, you're sending in 4000 and say, Extra goes toward principal, or just notate it that way. Yeah. They knock that principal down. That yeah. way, your interest. You know, the the more you knock down your principal, the quicker less interest you have. Yeah. Again, back to the forty year mortgage aspect of like, yeah. I would probably just do that just so I could make extra payments and just knock it down. Well, you know, quicker. that's the thing too. That the, right now it's not this case, but before COVID, and actually even a little bit during COVID, the thirty year interest rate was higher than the obviously the twenty. Yeah. And then the 15 was even cheaper. And there was, you know, you're talking a quarter to half. Like there was a huge spread yeah. there. It's not that way right now. So when we look at it and people are like, hey, I want to do a 20 year mortgage. And yeah, I look like, at the rate and if it's the same as a 30, I'm like, do a 30. You just make the extra, extra payment. payment. Yeah. So if it goes to 40, unless there is a marketable difference between the interest rate between 30 and 40, do a 40. Yeah. Make the extra payment, like you said. So, but that gives you that kind of that that breathing room in case you do have a rough month or a rough couple months. Yeah, uh, um, and you don't have to that much cash flow for sure. Well, cool, man. Appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Any uh, if anybody wants to reach out to kind of get some clarity as far or uh, advice or kind of what they are might be future to try to jump into get owning a home. What's the best way to reach out to you? Uh, I've got my website set up, bradschooler.com. It just takes you directly to my Ruoff page, okay. um, and it's got my phone number, you know, everything on it, and there you go. Uh, any good loan officer, their phone numbers or cell phone. So everybody basically in the world can have my cell phone number. Just got right. to go to get it. There you go. Well, we will see everybody back here in a couple of weeks We're on the next episode of the Keys to Commonwealth podcast. Brad, thanks again. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. To learn more about this podcast, visit our page at keystothecommonwealth.com. To connect with Landry regarding insuring your investment portfolio, email Landry at NovaInsuranceGroup.com or call 859-687-2004.